Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to possibly the biggest podcast that we've ever done on our channel. Uh, this is episode two um, of the general podcast where we will be discussing other teams, other sports, uh, or anything that's been going on in the world in general, That um, apart from politics, because that just gets a bit messy. Um, but we are here today with probably the biggest guest ever um, we've ever had. So uh, we, I will introduce him in two seconds. But first, before we go any further, please go and follow us and like and subscribe to all of our YouTube um, and SoundCloud. Uh, go and follow us on there as well to uh, get a notification when we go live. As well as that, please go and follow us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram. I've got to try and remember what all platforms I'm on. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, TikTok, Tumblr, and probably many more that I've forgotten to sign up for. But go and follow us on there as well. Today, we have... The, the absolute legend and i'm gonna say this as well um i think he's the biggest podcaster that's not a foot a past footballer uh on on any podcast that you can imagine um and he's, he's he's agreed to come on our podcast today to talk a little bit about himself uh, a little bit about crystal palace um uh, just going through that and we're going to talk a little bit about England and the new Premier League proposal because it's coming it's stirring up a little bit of controversial uh, feelings between a lot of people so uh, welcome Dan um, how are you? I'm good mate yourself? I'm very well very well very, I was very nervous not gonna lie building up to this um, very nervous because we haven't had someone with your stature come onto this podcast before. So thank you ever so much anyway for agreeing to come on. That's all right, mate. I'm just a normal bloke, mate. Just a football <laughs> fan who likes to talk about it for a living now. So, you know, it's, it's all good. You can't go wrong with that. Um, as I want to announce as well that this morning, uh, as a podcast, we have signed up to your Patreon um, and we will be um, sponsoring you each month um, for what, the work that you do. Um, also, uh, to everyone listening, to everyone um, watching, um, down below um, in the... Um, comment in the description there is a link to his twitter page um and to his patreon so please go and uh, sign up and help him grow a little bit more so we can overtake peter crouch um so yeah so first question i've got here for you is what is your first memory um this is a bit of a two-part question to this what's your first memory of crystal palace um and what made you fall in love with crystal palace um so i wouldn't say it's one specific moment mm -hmm. or game Really, I'm 31 years old, so I mean, yeah. If you think back to the period when Crystal Palace were in the Premier League, had Attilio Lombardo at the club, mm -hmm. he, because of the way that Crystal Palace's recent history has gone, took over as player manager at one point because of the tumultuous situation behind the scenes at the football club. And that season itself didn't end in particularly happy scenes because obviously it ended in a relegation in itself but as a as a young kid they were sort of my first memories of Palace and you know without getting too deep into my family history <laughs> and everything else um, from South London my dad's from South London my granddad's from South London we all grew up around the same area my granddad used to take my dad to Palace and my dad took me and it's just sort of passed on through the generations really and uh, that's why I feel so bonded and have this deep love for the football club because it's not just, you know, um, as you would these days when someone might be from North Wales and support Manchester United or from yeah. uh, wherever and supporting a club 300 miles away. I, I love the fact that I can get on one bus and it takes me 20 minutes to get to Selhurst and it's just part of my local routine, really. So what part of South London, because I'm from South London, I, yeah. I was born at St Thomas's Hospital um, and I grew up in Croydon um until i was three or four uh and then i moved to reading so are you from because my very and i i think i've admitted this on the podcast before but my first ever game i think ever uh going to a live stadium was crystal palace versus tottenham mm -hmm. um i can't remember i think it was 1997 I think it was 97, 98. I think it was around about that time. Um, and because of a dad, but I don't call him that because he doesn't do anything. Um, he was a Liverpool fan. So to try and get me enticed into supporting Liverpool, he told me it was Crystal Palace versus Liverpool. Um, which is, over your eyes. Yeah, exactly. But I remember that game. And so that was my very first memory. So who was the first player you fell in love with? 
probably Lombardo, to be fair, because, mm. I mean, at that point in our season, in our recent history, he was, he was such a cut above everyone else in that team. You know, mm. people still look back on him as, as the, the sort of shining light of that team because he was so far and away better than everyone else. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say falling in love, but the appreciation yeah. for what he was offering the side at that point was so far above everyone else that it was difficult not to see him as the, as the main man, really. Okay, so then we're going to flip the question. Who is the worst player you have seen or the person that's irritated? It's a two-part. What's the worst player you've seen in a Crystal Palace top that's gone, why are you still wearing that top? And secondly, who has annoyed you the most to this day that's worn it? I think... All right, so I feel a bit <laughs> bad talking about it, really, because... So I used to sit in main stand. Mm-hmm. Uh, used to go with my mum and dad and uh, moved over to the Homesdale when I was about... 15, 16, I think, because I wanted to shout and swear and all the rest of it. <laughs> um, but in the year when we were in the Premier League under Ian Dowie, um, yep. we had a left back called Gary Borrowdale. Mm-hmm. Come through the academy. He was from Sutton, I think. So he's local boy, etc. I think mm-hmm. my mum knew his mum via some sort of school link or something. But, I mean, he was a left back who just didn't tackle. You know, I, I'm not joking. He used to his way of marking people was to sort of give them two or three yards of space and just sort of back off and back off and back <laughs> off until they were in the penalty area. And one particular game, um, I think it might have been a couple of weeks before we ended up getting relegated, we'd lost at home. I was fuming. Um, and I the tunnel in, at Sellers Park is mm-hmm. right below where a staircase is on the side where you used to leave the main stand. Okay. And I ended up sort of shouting in frustration at Gary Borrowdale. And a guy that sat a row in front of me just turned around to me and said, that's not going to help his confidence, is it? And I was like, mate, I've watched this for two or three years every week. Like, he's in the team. I don't think he should be in the team. Ended up in this situation where I'm having almost like an actual fight with this guy over my frustration <laughs> with Gary Borrowdale. So in terms of the player over a long period of time that's frustrated mm. me, I'd probably say it was him. But in him, um, in 2010, when we nearly went out of business altogether, mm-hmm. ended up staying up on the last day thanks to a two-all draw of a Sheffield Wednesday. Mm-hmm. There was a guy, Stern John, I'm sure you remember mm-hmm. his name, mm-hmm. years gone by. Um, we were, I, can't, I think it was, yeah, we were two-all at that point and we needed a point to stay up and, and stave off extinction forever. Uh, he broke clear and went to... He could have easily squared the ball to Darren Ambrose, who would have had a tap mm-hmm. into an empty net in front of 6,000 people, third minute of added time. It would have been one of the greatest moments yeah. of my history. And rather than squaring the ball, he decided to have a shot himself. And Lee Grants ended up tipping it onto the post and it went across the goal line and was just inches from going in the net. And whilst, you know, it's ended up fine because we didn't end mm-hmm. up dying and everything else, had that ended up in a defeat, I think... I and thousands of others would have had Stern John down as like the biggest villain in <laughs> Palace history. So, yeah, it's one of those nearly stories that isn't quite as bad as it could have been. So, Crystal, so Crystal Palace for me as a club is one of those clubs that is fan base is very, very passionate. And I think a lot of fan bases, and I know Reading have as well, uh, and I'm, I, I will admit it as well, Reading have tried to slightly copy what you guys do in the um, main stand where there's all the jumping and noise and we've definitely tried to copy that with what we're trying to do as well um for me as crystal palace the fan base is always electric and it's always on fire and everything why do you think that crystal palace hasn't i, I, I don't try and try and say this is in a horrible way but crystal palace hasn't gone to the next level um they're always at the, the mid table bottom mid table where what, why hasn't Crystal Palace, because of the fan base and because of the passion and everything, hasn't really stepped on to the next bit? I think if you look at the Premier League, and it's obviously something we'll get onto mm-hmm. a bit regarding the whole project big picture thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you're a Reading fan, mm-hmm. I'm a Palace fan. It's almost as though there is a glass ceiling that exists in football finance that is almost impossible for clubs of our size to smash through. You know, you can do all you can in terms of youth development Mm -hmm. and be savvy in the transfer market, keep yourself afloat in the Premier League year on year. But for me, 
other than about seven or eight clubs in the Premier League, the other, say, 13, 14 that exist in the 20, their first priority every single summer is to make sure that the following season they stay up. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a Palace fan, a West Ham fan, you know, Bournemouth, Fulham, whoever. If you're in the Premier League, your first aim is to get to that 40-point mark. And it, it, it consumes you so much that often I feel as though, you know, in terms of the style of play you would need to be around the, the top six and the way that you'd have to attack teams, the, the conservatism comes into your style of play because of that. And then when you factor in all the other, you know, boundaries there with, with finance and wages and everything else, I mean, just to look at Sellers Park as a whole, there isn't a huge amount of corporate hospitality there. Mm. 25, 26,000 people. And in terms of, of that extra bit of money to, to put you up there with the big boys, you'd need a stadium of, say, forty to 50,000 mm -hmm. with a load of corporate selling out every week, which is why West Ham made that move to the London mm -hmm. Stadium, because of the extra uh, income you can get from those extra few thousand bums on seats. But at the same time, you still need to have a fan base that's big enough to do that. So, I mean, to a Reading fan or to a Brentford fan, Palace's money in the Premier League is a huge defining factor in our success. But even when you compare that to the likes of Liverpool and Manchester United, it's, it's a very small yeah. proportion of their funds. So, yeah, I think that's pretty much the main reason why. Um, so, what have you made of the transfer window so far? I know the domestic is still going on um, until Friday, where Premier League can't uh, do transfers with Premier League. Premier League can only do transfers with the EFL, but EFL can do transfers with the EFL. It's co confusing. Um, so, how have you think? Because so far you signed uh, Ezzy, um, Nathaniel, uh, Nathaniel Ferguson, they come on a free, um, and Mitchy Batshuayi has come on loan from Chelsea. You've also uh, done call ups. Um, to Tariq uh, Mitchell, um, Sam Woods, and uh, Brandon, is it Perrick? Pierrick. Um, so how have you think to the track? And you've got Nathaniel Klein that might be signing, might not be signing. So how have you sort of in general with this transfer window uh, compared it to others? How do you think you guys have got on? I would probably put it about a six to seven out of ten. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that it's bad. And I think if you look in comparison to some of our previous summer windows, mm -hmm. it's vastly more successful um i know for a fact there is there is more money to spend there which is why we're still being linked with the likes of ishmael assar and mm -hmm. uh, uh, josh king and saeed ben rama but i mean there's a sort of a free horse race going on for ben rama at the moment between mm -hmm. ourselves aston villa and west ham mm -hmm. similarly ishmael assar is being linked with potentially a move to man united mm -hmm. um but it, a lot of the time as a palace fan we get any time a player, especially an attacking winger or a striker comes in or is linked with us, opposition fans immediately think, oh, that's, that's Zaha leaving because that's just a yearly occurrence for us. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, he isn't going anywhere because now that the window's closed for Premier League to Premier League and Premier yeah. League to Europe, he's not going to be signing for Brentford, for example. He could come on London Renan if he were like. He could. I mean, I don't know <laughs> about it, but yeah. You <laughs> but yeah, I, I would say... A lot of our transfer windows, from a fan's perspective anyway, need to be geared towards having a plan B for if Zaha either leaves or gets injured. Because for the last two or three years, and it's, it's not necessarily anyone's fault, because when you're a club of our size and you've got a player of Zaha's quality in your squad, mm -hmm. you're going to build a team around him, similar mm -hmm. to how West Ham did when they had Dimitri Payet. Yeah. But um, it's sort of like we're trying to give ourselves another option that doesn't necessarily involve Zaha so that we'd be able to maintain a Premier League presence for the long term without him. Um, and I hopefully, you know, between now and Friday, we can get another player in that can aid our chances of doing that. Yeah, and I, I always think of, like, with Wilfred Zaha as well, because I know you have a lot of love for him. Um, you know, I've seen all over Twitter how much you love him and you know, all of that. So uh, we know that uh, Crystal Palace love him. But do you not think he's... Um, I think the one thing from me about Zaha is... It, sometimes his attitude doesn't help him um it's like with last season I don't know what, what you guys are but from someone who sit from the outside in is he wanted this move away he wanted to go to Arsenal and he wanted to go abroad he wanted to leave and then when he come back he didn't really put anyone to sort of think oh yeah that he should have left he's just sort of sat back and wasn't the Zaha we've seen before um what did you think about Zaha's season last year I think um it I mean, it's a very, it's a multifaceted situation. Mm. So you've obviously got a kid there that broke through into Palace's first team, um, what, when he was 17 in 2010. 
And he's gone on for the next two or three years and, and really built a reputation for himself. Mm-hmm. That move to Manchester United, obviously, I mean, I don't know how much you know about his history, but he was the last player that Alex Ferguson ever signed as mm-hmm. Manchester United manager. Mm-hmm. And then when he eventually made the move to Manchester United, Alex Ferguson was no longer there and it was David Moyes. Um, and David Moyes, not necessarily blaming him, but because of the size of the job and the pressure on him, I don't think he particularly fancied Wilfred Zaha, which meant he didn't get any games. And as a consequence of that, he's left with this tag of the kid that flopped at Man United. Mm. So he went on loan to Cardiff, didn't really do anything there because his head wasn't in the right place. Mm-hmm. He's come back to us. He understands us. We understand him. And he's gone from strength to strength again. Um, but there's always this... I would imagine anyway, having spoken to him once and, and followed his career very closely, mm. there's this nagging hope in his mind that he's going to get another opportunity to prove that he is the player that can still do it at the top mm. level. I don't think any Palace fan would necessarily begrudge him that. We all understand his quality. We all understand his desire to test himself at Champions League level. However, and this is unfortunately something that keeps on rearing its head window after window, his value to us, which goes back to the whole point of the transfer window that we're trying to usher in these players that can replace what he gives us, mm-hmm. his value to Crystal Palace as a Premier League club is greater than what the likes of Arsenal or Everton or Borussia Dortmund will be willing to part with to sign him. So to an outsider, he may be worth 30, 40 million pounds. Whereas to us, because Premier League football is the be all and end all and he's worth what mm-hmm. he's worth, we're not prepared to part with him for anything less than, say, 55 or 60. So there's that gap there of, say, 15 to 20 million. Wilf himself wants to be allowed to move. He signed a five-year contract two years ago now, I believe, Mm -hmm. that didn't have a release clause in it. So now he's stuck in this period of limbo where he wants to move. There's no formal figure that anyone has, has set aside to say, once an offer of that comes in, you can go. And as a consequence, it's this push and pull between his desire to move and our willingness to let him do so for a fee that we don't feel is acceptable. And unfortunately, that is where we found ourselves for large parts of the last couple of years. And it has sort of semi-impacted his performance. I'm not really one to to pour scorn on him because I think a lot of outsiders, it's not your fault because Mm -hmm. obviously you're watching him a lot less than we do. Mm -hmm. Teams often, especially at Sellers Park, they come to play us, they know he's the danger man. They'll double and triple up mm. on him. And when we didn't have the likes of Eze or Michi Batshuayi in the team last season, they can do that without any real fear of, of another player popping up and hurting him. So he sort of got marked out of games because there was just a, a huge number of bodies on him. And then people judge him on that rather than his actual ability. So it's, it's a very, as I say, it's a multifaceted mm. problem, really. Uh, I think Zaha is one, one of the best players in the one of the top probably 10 wingers in the Premier League. Mm. Um, and it's interesting for, for me from an outsider point of view is I think I think he's, he's one of those moves where I think it'd be interesting to see what he would be like at a bigger club. But at the same time, it's like he's a Crystal Palace boy. Mm. And for me, it's like, yeah, I understand you want Champions League football and you want to go and prove yourself. Yeah, I completely get that. Every player's desire is to do that. But then at the same time, I'm like, just stay with Palace and just push them higher. Um, think, sorry to interrupt. Just no, 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 you go ahead. The, the, the problem he's got is that he, he's left once already, obviously, yeah. and it wasn't a success. We all know that in the right system, with the right manager and with the right people around him, he could flourish at a top club. But if he were to move again at 28, for example, and it didn't work out again, there's no real path back. No. You know, when we brought him back the first time, it was everyone was on board with it. If he makes a second breakaway, and then for this, for whatever reason, it doesn't even have to be down to his ability, but just circumstance, mm-hmm. he decides this isn't for me again. He hasn't really got that path back into the Palace side, and that could leave him at 30 odd years old, sort of in limbo. Um, so, I mean, you get people saying, "Oh, you're holding him hostage," and I always say, "Well, 120 grand a week and the adoration of thousands of people <laughs> when you grew up." Mm. I wouldn't mind that. Um, so, I don't know. I don't think he's necessarily against staying. I think it's more frustration at the people at the top of the tree at Palace not allowing him to spread mm. his wings. As I say, it's not as straightforward as just, oh, you can go, because there's all sorts of things bound up in it. So, do you think he, if, if, if Crystal Palace made some big, summers, big signings, um, someone that's really going to push the club forward, 
Um, do you think he would just be content in staying or do you think he will always have that desire to want to move on to a bigger club? I feel like this summer is, is something of a tipping point purely because he's 28 in November. Mm -hmm. um, for a winger who relies quite heavily on pace, obviously mm -hmm. there's, there's tricks in there as well and the ability to beat a man, but that comes hand in hand with pace. Those two things are, you know, they coexist. So if you were a 29-year-old winger, the chances of a club like Everton or, or Arsenal parting with big money for you are diminishing all the time. I feel like 27 is sort of the tipping point for the top value for a winger. Yeah, it's like so the, it prime, well be, the prime. Exactly, the prime there is. As soon as you get beyond 27, you're going to have people saying, well, where's the resale value in this guy mm -hmm. if he does well for us for two years? It's, it's not there, particularly when you consider the wages that he'd command. So I think the plan from behind the scenes at least, is because we've just got Category 1 status for the academy confirmed. Mm -hmm. Obviously, South London is full of quality young mm. footballers and that's been a huge project for everyone at the football club for quite some time now. Um, if we can get that up and running and, and get a constant stream of players coming through the team, obviously, we've already brought Eze in. Uh, batshuayi has got a potential move on a permanent basis if he does well for mm -hmm. us this year. And like I said, if we can sign a, a Sar or a Ben Rama, he may well be minded to think, do you know what, this isn't actually that bad. Yeah. And when he was given the captain's armband against Manchester United a few weeks back, he looked like a, a different guy altogether. Obviously, he scored two goals. But I feel like maybe that's what he needs to sort of kick on at Palace, to be given that, that status as, as the actual leader of the team rather than just the guy we look to to create. Yeah, so we'll, we'll leave. So hopefully Saha stays and pushes you guys a little bit further. But let's talk about your start of the season. Um, you had a win against Southampton, uh, a win against um, Manchester United, and then the ball and the cup. I didn't cast the cup because the cup's a cup. No, the cup. It's, the, it's the worthless cup as well, so that no one really cares about. Uh, and then you lost the loss against Everton, a bit controversial, that one, and lost to um, Chelsea. Um, how have you made the start of the season uh, for yourself, for, the, for Crystal Palace this year? I think, you know, if, if someone had offered us six points after the first four games, given the quality of the opposition we've mm -hmm. come up against, we'd have all taken it. Mm -hmm. You know, Southampton wasn't a given by any means on the first day of the season. There were a lot of people expecting Southampton to be around mm -hmm. the top sort of 10 to eight teams this year anyway. So to beat them on the first day and then obviously to go to Old Trafford and, and do what we did there, admittedly, you know, the way they're going so far this season, it looks a little bit less impressive than it did at first because mm -hmm. of all the problems behind the scenes. But, you know, and even with the Everton game, obviously we've lost it. Like you said, it was controversial circumstances with the penalty, etc. So, uh, overall, the first three performances in the league were fantastic. Um, we sort of capitulated against Chelsea. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. I mean, it's something that if you watch Roy Hodgson's teams, especially away from home against the big boys, they it's often geared towards keeping it tight for 45 minutes and then trying to hit teams on the break mm -hmm. in the second half. We managed to get to half-time at nil-nil, which was perfect. Um, and then there was an error from Mamadou Sacco that's let them break the deadlock on about 50, I think. Mm -hmm. And from there, the, the sort of game plan just fell down around their ears. But, I mean, it's the same. Sim it's a similar way of going about the game as we managed at Manchester United, difference being that we scored the first goal there. So you sort of have to take the rough or the smooth with Roy Hodgson a little bit. But I'm, I'm hopeful once the international break ends and we've got a bit more of a favourable run of games that we can get some more points on the board, to be fair. So, what is your opinion of Roy Hodgson? Are you a fan of Roy as, as your manager? Um, if, if Roy Hodgson wasn't in charge, who would you like to have in charge? What, what is your personal opinion on Roy Hodgson and him himself? I feel like um, it, it's a difficult thing to put your finger on, really, because mm -hmm. when he came into the football club, obviously he replaced Frank de Boer. Mm -hmm. We lost, I think, the first three or four games of the season without scoring. Ended up I mean, we were a mess, if truth be told. And, mm. and he was brought in to sort of steady the ship. He's done exactly that. He's now been here over three years. Mm -hmm. um, and whilst his football is, for want of a better phrase, a bit boring, mm -hmm. um, he's pretty much a guarantee of Premier League survival each year. And you may not uh, be enthralled with the football that we play. You may not be particularly excited by it, but he gets the job done. And I think from a owner's perspective, you know, Steve Parrish is probably seeing Roy Hodgson is worth his weight in gold because he guarantees the Premier League status that's so hard to guarantee. Um, but there's obviously a, a desire amongst the fan base to try and unlock us a little bit. I think if you look at our period under 
Alan Pardew, for example, he mm. came in after Tony Pulis, and there was a there was a whole period there where he was saying we've got to take the shackles off and we've got to try and play a bit more expansively. And, and when it works, it's great. But then when it doesn't, you can be four three up away at Swansea in the ninety first minute and lose five four. Mm-hmm. And people think that's fun, but it isn't fun no, when you're in a five four defeat in stoppage time. So I mean, I don't know. It's, it's horses for courses, really. Mm. I personally. If I'm talking about it with my frugal, careful head on, would like someone similar to Sean Dyche, maybe even Sean Dyche himself, to come mm-hmm. in, because it wouldn't be too much of a departure in style of play from Roy Hodgson, but you know he'd be having a bit more of a, a flair mm-hmm. to his, his squad that he's got at his disposal. There's potentially a bit more money because Burnley have spent nothing this summer, mm-hmm. um, so I dare say he'd be open to that if if the opportunity was there. And I think everyone's aware that Roy Hodgson's not going to be around forever. You know, he's 73 now, I think. Mm. He signed a one-year extension last summer. But you're sort of kicking the can down the road a little bit. And I think it's potentially because of the unknown element of him moving on and us struggling to adapt to his um, departure. But at the same time, you've got to bite the bullet at some point. So it'll be interesting to see what we do this summer in relation to the managerial situation. Yeah, for me with Roy Hodgson, he's always been one of those managers that you can rely on, but you can't ever know, but you can never push forward. He's one of those that will get you to where you need to go to, but that's it. There's yeah. like a barrier with him. Um, but I, I really hope you guys push on and go further. Um, we predicted as a podcast to say, at the start of the season, before the start, we did a Premier League prediction. Um, and we predicted you guys to finish around about 14th, 15th, but safe. Um, from relegation mid table, near mid table, more uh, points wise than you are with relegation. Where where do you see yourself? Where do you see Crystal Palace? Not wait, like Champions League for a ball. Let's, let's be let's be realistic. <laughs> but but where would you see yourself? And what you, what would you class a very good season? I, I think your prediction of four wins and fifteen is pretty much spot on. I think mm-hmm. that is what Roy Hodgson offers you, and you have to sort of accept that really, rather than worrying too much about being in the drop zone. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of a very good season. I'd say top half, really. You know, that it sounds a bit defeatist, but when you look at, as I say, that the finances that you're up against, the quality of the squads, you know, we've got a good starting eleven and a good couple of people off the bench, but I wouldn't necessarily say the strength in depth is there to maintain that throughout an entire campaign and hope to push on to, say, top eight. Um, mm. It was a period just after lockdown finished where we beat Bournemouth. Uh, we looked like we were going to be pushing mm-hmm. for Europe and then it all just fell apart. So as soon as you start to count your chickens as a Palace fan, it, it tends to fall apart. So, I mean, I'm just probably looking at ninth as, as an extremely successful season. Yeah. Now, obviously, you dream of more, but it never really works out that way. So, so I want to go into something a little bit non-Crystal Palace, but something personal to yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, before we go any further, anyone listens to this, we haven't discussed any of the questions or anything beforehand. I've just thought of them and I'm going through them beforehand. But there was, a, there was something that come up due to two people that work at Sky Sports that have said stuff about you, what you have pers- apparently have done, um, the alleged comments that were done to you. I don't want to get into that because for certain things, because I, uh, you've, what's gone on. But what I would like to ask you is, is when all of that was going on, as a podcast, we try and uh, open up a little bit about more about mental health um, for men um, and try and do a little bit more. So with all the stuff that was happening and that was going on, um, how did that affect you um, mentally during all of the accusations and everything that were proven wrong in the end? Um, All the accusations. And how did you sort of, because with your content that I can see as well, it just stayed the same. You were just a very happy, sometimes angry towards a lot of things, but you're, you're a normal fan with everything that goes on. How did that affect you? Um, I mean, it is one of those situations where I can't go into specific... Yeah, no, 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 I didn't want you to. I just want to talk to you personally about yeah, your mental... Of course, I will. I'll answer. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I just sort of wanted to put it out there that yep. I can't really talk about specific parts of it. Um, in terms of the, the mental side of it, I'll be honest with you. I was laying on my bed watching Palace play Charlton in a pre-season friendly on a, on a stream. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just looked at my phone. I had about five or six text messages in the space of about two or three minutes from my mates and people that I know from Palace, mm-hmm. all of whom saying, don't worry about this, mate. We know it's rubbish. You know, and I'm like, what, what, what? Mm-hmm. So I've looked on my Twitter. I've seen what was said. Um, 
And as I say, without getting into too mm-hmm. much depth about it, because I don't really want the recriminations that mm-hmm. might come my way for mm-hmm. whatever reason, um, I like to think of myself as not just a non-racist, but a vehement anti-racist. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm constantly doing my best to stick up for, you know, people that I feel have been wronged in the media, whether that's the witch hunt that goes on about Raheem Sterling, mm-hmm. whether it's Alex Scott and the perception people have of her in the media. Yeah. It's, I'm not trying to, you know, oh, I've got black friends. It's, it isn't me at all. But I just, I call out um, what I see to be injustice as and where it comes. So, you know, when I look at the way people may perceive what I did, of course, you could look at it and say, oh, you've, you've overstepped the line in some of the, the tweets you might have sent about him in terms of his personal uh, approach to looking at transfers. But there was never any racism mm-hmm. involved in that at all. Mm-hmm. And thankfully... I'll be honest, it was a bit of a roller coaster because when someone who's got a verified account, works for a company as big as that, puts out a thing about you, there's a fear that regardless of whether or not there's any truth to it, it's going to catch fire and people are going to start accusing you of all sorts. So the first sort of 30 to 60 minutes of it, I'm thinking, you know, what the hell is going on here? Like, what? I can't control this. This is Mm -hmm. ridiculous. But then quite quickly it turned around the other way and the support I was getting was just immense. And mm-hmm. I'll, I'll be honest with you, like, you're talking about mental health of men and how it's a bit of a taboo subject. Sitting there on the sofa with my missus, just thinking to myself, you know, this is one, I have no real real way of controlling what way the wind's going to blow. Yeah. But then when you get someone with the stature of Troy Townsend, who's obviously hugely involved in the Kick It Out campaign, publicly backing me. When you've got Ian Wright, who is one of the most famous people in mm-hmm. English football, who has an obvious vested interest in it because of the nature of the comment and mm-hmm. his whole situation. He came out and publicly said, you know, things on my behalf. It was overwhelming. And I, I won't deny, like, I, I got quite emotional about mm-hmm. it because that 24 hours immediately following was just crazy. I mean, I was trending on Twitter in the UK. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I don't want to make a thing of it like I've, had some sort of victory. That's not the way I see it. Mm-hmm. But to see the outpouring of, of support that I had on social media was was overwhelming, to say the least. And obviously, at this point now, I'm, I'm still trying to just talk about football daily. And hopefully, I do a good job of that and people appreciate where I'm coming from. And, and, and I'm going to say something. And people that you can't say it, but I can. Um, because it's my podcast. And if you want to criminate me, have a go. Because um, I couldn't give a shit. Um, so for me personally, I think what he did was completely and utterly wrong. Um, I, Jim White as well we all know that he doesn't really understand football um, at all we've seen some of the stuff he doesn't talk sport as well so he just talks utter rubbish so for what, I've, what I found very fascinating was as soon as I, I heard something about you and I was like right I'm going to go and check it out to see what happened and I saw what he said and I saw what Jim White put and then I was looking down in all the comments and normally around about 90% of the time when you look down and what everyone's tweeting about it you can see a trend of Okay, yeah, he's done something bad. But when I looked down, the tr- what was said about you was he would never do anything like that. That was something that's never happened. This won't ever happen in doing it. That's very, very rare. And mm-hmm. I think that's a testament not only to the people that listen to you and people that know you, but I think that's a massive testament to you as a person as well. Because you now have this, everyone knows you, um, rightly or wrongly, in whatever personal way they think of you, the same with me as well, is... Everyone knows what type of person you are. And for people to back you and, and support you, for me, I think that's the biggest thing. And I think what shows is, is the support that you have is unbelievable and amazing. And for me, I wanted to have you on this podcast to talk to you because of one, I wanted to get your insight to football and get your opinion and have a debate about what's going on. But at the same time, I wanted to tell you that there are people, you may see it on Twitter, but I would rather say it face to screen <laughs> because you can't do it face to face, where I can tell you that there is a amount of support and you have been doing excellent and you just keep doing what you're doing and you've been out absolutely brilliant yeah i mean one person specifically said and like i say I, i'm going to be treading very carefully about mm-hmm. it i mm-hmm. don't want anyone coming back at me with some comment. Yep. um but one person said in relation to the allegations as soon as you call him racist you are calling 60 odd thousand people that follow him racist by definition yep. because if anyone does follow a racist openly then they would be themselves comfortable with racism and to do that is to call me a racist and I'm not happy about it because if I'd ever seen it, I'd have one called him out, two blocked his account and three made a point of telling everyone that does yeah. follow him that they're wrong to do it because of this. 
but you haven't actually been able to do that because there is no racism there. I think there's a, there's a key defining factor for me where if you don't agree with someone and if you don't like them, that is still freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. to, to throw out an accusation such as that is a risky thing to do. And, and I'm just glad that, you know, the allegations were put away by so many people in, in a fashion they were because it, it had the potential to ruin my life. Mm, um, yeah. and, and thankfully it hasn't. And thankfully, you know, I've got the support I've got, but that was never a guarantee. So yeah, I mean, other than that, I don't particularly want to discuss it because yep. it's not a particularly pleasant subject. And I understand obviously you've got a brooch, et cetera. But yeah, just draw a line under it. And I'm a football fan who loves talking about football. And thankfully, I can do that for a living now. That's absolutely perfect. Right, then moving on then. Let's talk a little bit about England. Um, a bit about Gareth, Let's talk a bit about Gareth Southgate. He's a bit of a Crystal Palace. He comes through the Crystal Palace youth and the all of that. What is your opinion on Crystal pa um Not Crystal Palace. What is your opinion on Gareth Southgate? What he's done since the World Cup? Um, and the, but we're not going to we'll talk about the Belgium game in a sec, but just before the Belgium game, what was your opinion on what was going on? Um, I was, funny enough, it's something I covered not to try and plug it, but on the no, plug it, trust me, plug it, Friday. plug um, it away. You know, it's, it's weird with Gareth Southgate because it almost feels like the summer of 2018 and the waistcoat and the, the run <laughs> semi finals and Harry Maguire being England's savior and everything else has flipped so dramatically in the space of two years that it almost feels like 20. You know, I, I can't... I mean, I went through the squad. Deli Alley at the moment is, is out of the picture completely at Spurs. Harry Maguire is seen as a liability at Manchester United by everybody. Uh, Jordan Pickford's, you know, crisis of confidence. All these people that were pivotal to Gareth Southgate's squad just two years ago are now almost seen as, not has-beens, but they're, they're seen as liabilities and it, mm -hmm. it shows not necessarily the fickleness of football, but the pace at which it moves on. Um, and even with Gareth Southgate on a personal level, you know, in the summer of 2018, that he was seen as this statesman, this mm -hmm. new world view on, on everything that was going on in the game and in politics, etc. Mm -hmm. We made it through to the semi-finals, and there was this huge outpouring of, of joy and excitement. And when you look at it in a cold light of day and you consider that it was just, you know, Colombia and Sweden and not your France or your Spain or wherever, it, it does sort of put a dampener on it. And I don't know. I mean, I said on Friday, it's almost as if, as England manager, it's a, it's a double thing because you have to be completely set on winning almost every game you play and you have to be the statesman alongside mm. it. And if one of those two things goes slightly awry you're going to have people getting the knives out. And you look at the hypocritical way that he's handled uh, Mason Greenwood and Phil Foden's indiscretions when compared to the Ben Chilwell, Jaden Sancho, mm -hmm. Tammy Abraham thing. And people are understandably going to be thinking, well, where's, where's the logic there? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, admittedly, we've beaten Belgium. As I said, they're the number one team in the world and you should be patting yourselves on the back for that. But it still comes alongside this gripe about Mason Mount and Jack Grealish and whether or not he's using the right person in the right position. And unfortunately, the only way to silence those doubters is to win every game. And, and because of the nature of our performances in recent times, that, that has become harder for him to do. Yeah, I, had, I didn't, wouldn't say I had an altercation. I didn't have an altercation. I had a chat with a fan on Twitter, um, two of them that were on there. Um, and, and they're very much, they're Reading fans and we always have a debate about certain things as well. And the thing that he said, and he said exactly what you said, was Pickford's not been doing very well and Harry Maguire's not being confident. Grealish is not being picked properly and, and everything. My personal opinion on it was, is maybe Pickford isn't playing well for Everton, but when has he ever done anything wrong for England? He has mm. never put a foot wrong for England. Anytime he's put that English shirt on, if Everton wish they could have the England shirt Pickford instead of the one that turns up for them. Harry Maguire, I think the issue with Harry Maguire personally, what I think is England play, play Maguire to his play style, what his best way of playing is. And with Man United, they're not doing that. What Man United want is two defenders high up the pitch, the edge of the halfway line and control the play. Harry Maguire hasn't got the pace and he's never done the pace at the high up. So you've got to drop him back. That's why you have a Carl Walker or unfortunately Eric Dyer who had a shocking game um, against Belgium 
but you, you always have to have two defenders to help him because mm-hmm. he is very, very good at what he does. But as soon as he maybe lacks the concentration, there's someone there to help him. And I think Southgate knows the players. And I think what, what fans need to realise is the players that are just coming in are just coming in to learn about Southgate's style. And he has a very different style to everyone else. And what I think they need to learn is that it's a very young team. I think there's, there's the youngest team against Wales when we played and was the youngest team in a certain amount of history. So I, I get what people criticise, but at the same time, so when, it comes, when the chips come to the pan, Southgate always does something well. And I Mm. think we need to sort of remember that. And if you look at the World Cup, yeah, it wasn't the greatest teams, but at the same time, you can only beat the teams that are in front of you. And he did that until Croatia. I I do think as well, it's sort of, it's impossible to put a tangible link on it because, you know, it's, it's more of an ideological view. But I think when you've got fans not being allowed in stadiums and when Mm. you've got all the coronavirus thing going on and you've got the the worries about so many other things, England and the stories that would normally be part of a a wider footballing landscape, they become magnified. Yeah. It's almost as though Gareth Southgate, England, the whole thing becomes a vessel for people's frustration Mm -hmm. elsewhere. I mean, I'm not suggesting it wouldn't be a a story and a a point of contention if things were normal as they were two years ago, but I do think that it's, it's heightened because of everyone else's yeah. annoyance and frustration with so many other parts of the world at the moment. So people will say, similar to me, oh yeah, we beat Belgium, but we didn't play very well. Whereas before it would be like, get a grip, we beat Belgium, shut up. <laughs> yeah. like, <laughs> That's what I'm like. No, that is, so... football, and because yeah. you're stuck in your house and you're just watching it on a telly in an empty stadium, people are going to dig deeper into that because they've got less to distract themselves with, yeah. you know. So, I, I don't know. I, I, so, I can't prove that, but I think it is a factor. Yeah, I think it definitely is. And for me, it's very much... I was very much one of those people that were like, we beat Belgium. We Remember, we their number one, yeah? They may not have been the best play style of what we can play and maybe beat them more. But at one point, we shut Lukaku out the second half. We, Kevin De Bruyne, I don't think, really did anything. And we shut him out as well with the game as well. And for me, it's like, right, if you think about it, let's think about it about six, seven years ago plus, when we had Sven Goran Eriksson and Steve McLaren. If we come up against teams like we did when we played like the Belgium or the Germany or the Spain, we would have got battered. Well, this play style would not have happened. So for me, I've got, I remember, right, we had this utter rubbish. Now we've got really good depth in most of the positions. Let's just enjoy it and try and take it with, with what it is at the moment. Um, so what is your opinion on May? Me personally, I think when Kane is fully fit, and with the way that Dominic Calvert-Lewin are playing at the moment, do you think that there's a way that Southgate will be able to play Kane and Calvert-Lewin together? I think, I don't know, really. I, when you look at the dilemma from, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago with the whole mm-hmm. Alcon, Lampard and Gerrard into the same yeah. field, it's almost square pegs and round holes. Mm-hmm. And because you've got Calvert-Lewin scoring the goals he has for Everton, and because Harry Kane is Harry Kane, you're going to try and... and put everyone in the same pot and try and mix it all together when it doesn't necessarily work. And I'll probably get pelters from Everton fans for saying this, but last season, you wouldn't have looked at Dominic Calvert-Lewin as an England squad member, let alone a starter. So alongside what you were saying about the young players coming in and learning the way of playing, I don't think Calvert-Lewin or anyone would have necessarily a problem with Kane being the main man. Mm -hmm. It would make a difference if there was a space within the side to clearly play a 4-4-2. But if you look at the way Ancelotti has has built up Dominic Calvert-Lewin in this last 12 months, he's been very clear to him that he should be staying inside the Mm -hmm. 12-yard area in front of the box and be a poacher. Now, if you're going to do that, you're almost treading on the toes of Harry Kane, who is that poacher for England anyway. So... If there's a way Gareth Southgate thinks it works, then we can obviously give it a go. But I wouldn't necessarily say it's the be-all and end-all to just chuck as many natural goal scorers into the team as possible because you could do that with Danny Ings. You could do it with... Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's got to be a style of play that fits the eleven, as you said, which is what England try to do. So, I don't know. I mean, it's not a bad option to have in the sport, obviously. And if you go to a tournament and you can bring him on and you can mix it up, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's the best thing from the start, no. So, what is your opinion on the Grealish situation then? Do you what, think he should be? Do you think he should be playing more, or what, what, what's your what's your opinion? I'll be honest. I mean, obviously, people know that I love Wilfred Zaha. Mm-hmm. I love Jack Grealish. I just think he is 
something of a throwback and he doesn't fit into a, a box like many other players mm. do within that Indian setup. I saw someone on Twitter saying that he thinks a large reason why Jack Grealish is, is not necessarily front and centre of Gareth Southgate's plans comes down to the fact that they are so different personality-wise. And I don't know whether that's the case or not. I think maybe you're maybe clutching at a little bit of straws, but maybe mm. there's a little bit of truth in that as well. Because if you look at him, he's very much the main man at Villa. He drags them through games. He gets the ball to feet all the time. He, he defends, he attacks, he creates, he does it all. And maybe from Gareth Southgate's perspective, he doesn't want a player that's going to do it all. He's going to want a player that's going to fit into a specific role. And maybe he worries that Jack Grealish isn't going to be able to conform to that. I personally feel as though when you've got a player that's that transformative and that steps up time and time again for his club, you should be looking to, to cultivate that and bring him into what you can offer. I'm not yeah. suggesting Mason Mount's a bad player. And I've had to sort of semi-defend myself to Chelsea fans over this. It's not... When I draw those comparisons between Gareth Southgate's view of Mason Mount and his view of um, Jack Grealish. It's not to diminish Mason Mount's talent, but I feel like Gareth Southgate doesn't give anywhere near enough credit to Jack Grealish. And it's one of those situations mm. where if he was playing for a Liverpool or a Manchester City, I think he'd be an instant pick mm. in the starting eleven, And mm. that frustrates me because as a Palace fan, I saw Wilfred Zaha get ignored for three or four years when we were crying out for a natural wide man. And it just does feel sometimes mm -hmm. as though club stature plays too much of a role in the selection process. Yeah, and we spoke about this on, on the podcast on the, I think it was the last Wednesday or Thursday. And we, we talked about stature and it's wrong that the stature comes about. But at the same, and, and what I could see is I could see both sides. I could see people saying stature is wrong because there's lower people down, lower down the league, uh, the bottom of the Premier League championship players that can easily slot into the um, England team and do better than what there is before. But at the same time, if these players are playing in the Champions League and getting experience like that, for a tournament-based uh, mindset with like the Champions League, it's the same as like going into the Euros. You've got a group stage, then you've got the knockouts. So then they will give them a lot more experience and sort of mental, mental for it. And I think with Grealish, with my personal opinion on Grealish, why he's not getting it, is I think his reputation of what he's done in the past has really hindered him. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think Southgate doesn't trust him more than he does a Mount or anyone like that. It's because whenever Grealish has been given an opportunity before, he goes and absolutely screws it up himself. And it, he's, getting, he's getting there now when he's getting older, and he, but he still, during lockdown, broke the rules. Um, he still did stuff. And for me, I think Grealish has always got that lingering, he's going to do something. What's he going to do next? And I think maybe that might be the thing that's not helping yeah, I mean him at the moment. That sort of goes to tally with what the Villa fan said to me about his whole personality and how it's so opposed to Gareth Southgate. Mm. My argument with that is, and you can go back to Alex Ferguson and his view of Eric Cantona. There's a famous story where there was a, a club do. Alex Ferguson's obviously, you know, iron fist, very strong on his players, etc. They were all supposed to be wearing club suits. Eric Cantona turned up in a track suit or a jacket that he wasn't supposed to be wearing. The entire squad expected Ferguson to rip them apart. Ferguson didn't do anything, and he said, sometimes you've just got to let the people do what they do, because he understood what Cantona yeah. brought to the team. Now, I'm not suggesting Jack Grealish is the best player in our squad, but I don't necessarily feel as though when you're an England manager and you get these players for two weeks at a time, at most, unless it's a major tournament, you should be making huge judgments on their character, because you don't see them every day mm -hmm. anyway. Like, Dean Smith sees him every day. Dean Smith built a team around him. You know, and it, it's something that I feel as though often gets blown out of proportion. If Gareth Southgate saw Jack Grealish in an England camp, similar to how Mason Greenwood and Phil Foden did, mm -hmm. and they, he went off and contacted some Icelandic woman and ended up in bed with her, then you could say, well, hang on a minute, you've pushed this too far. Jack Grealish hasn't done that while on England duty. No. His quote that he gave last week about, I want to play left wing, I'll play 10, I'll play 8, I'll play right wing, I don't care, I just want to play for England. To me, that's what I want to see. Mm -hmm. That's someone that desperately wants to represent his country. And yeah, you could point out specific indiscretions that have taken place in the last six months. But Carl Walker broke lockdown. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's still starting and he's a golden boy according to Gareth Southgate. So there are, it's multifaceted and there yeah. are hypocritical tones to it for me. But I wouldn't judge people based on their personality over their ability. It's basically how I view it. It's just been announced just now that Ben Cheerwell and Kieran Trippier 
of both withdrawn from the England squad for the game against Denmark tomorrow, today, when you guys listen to this. Uh, so that could be... Saka looks like he'll get his start. Um, I quite like Bakayo Saka. Um, yes. So if you could pick... This is gonna. This is gonna be. I'm gonna think about this as well, so I can answer it. So I don't leave you in the dark. If you could pick one of the youngsters that have just come through now, um, like the Bakaya Sakos and all of them, and the under 21 player that is going to be the main for the future to come, where everyone in the country is going to get behind that one person, who do you think it's going to be? Am I allowed to say Jaden Sancho, or is that too mainstream? You can say whoever you want. Well, I feel as though Jaden Sancho is is the mm-hmm. one. Because I, for me, if you're going to leave a club like Manchester City and you're going to go to a yeah. club like Russia Dortmund and you're going to have the impact that he's had at his age, you know, I, I feel like almost the fact that I've asked you the question of whether or not I can mention him highlights <laughs> how good he is. Do you see what yeah. I mean? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. He's a young, young kid and he's made that much of a dent on everyone's impression that he almost feels like a 25 year old. Yeah. And, and that in itself, highlights to me how big a player he's going to be for us. Because to go to a new country and not just do well, but to become a huge part of that side, you know, they're challenging for titles, they're Champions League, they're, they're top of the tree. And admittedly, Haaland is, is the golden boy there mm. and he's the one that puts the ball in the back of the net with the most regularity. But I feel like Jaden Sancho is going to be the main man for the next decade. Because of what he offers. Yeah, do you know what makes me... There's a couple of players, I think, for me as well. But with Jadon Sancho, the thing that really sort of is remarkable, I find, is not only has he left England to go to Germany to go and play football and give it a challenge, but he's become more of a popular name than Marco Royce in mm. Dortmund. And if you think of Dortmund at the moment, Dortmund in general will always be Marco Royce's Dortmund. But mm-hmm. if you think about Dortmund in general now, you think, if you go uh, Dortmund, the first two names people are going to say is Jane Sancho and um, Harlan. Yep. That's the first two names they're going to say. And for me, I think if he went to Man United, I don't think that would have been a good move for him, personally. I agree. Um, I don't think, I think Man, Man United, just because of what's going on behind closed doors, um, what's going, manager-wise as well, I don't think Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's anywhere near good enough to sort of help Sancho to keep going and progressing to the next level. And, and for me, I think Dortmund and staying in Germany, and probably, it, it's like I, I saw uh, Sky Sports say, and they said, if Man United don't get Sancho now, and if Sancho carries on going the way he is, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes to Real Madrid next yeah, summer. Real Madrid, Juventus, someone huge yeah. who's going to be in the running for the Champions League trophies every year. And that, that really does sort of highlight where I'm coming from. Because mm-hmm. he's, what, 20, 21 years old? It's a joke. I mean, I don't actually know. Is he 19, 20, 21? I'm, I'm Googling it now. So, I mean, but to make the impact that he has at that age is quite astounding. You know, the two of us are waxing lyrical over him. He's gone to a new culture. 20. Yeah, 20. There you go. See, so, I mean, how many players do you know who've made that impact on the Premier None. League? At 20? And it, ironically, had he stayed at Manchester City rather than moving to Dortmund, you may not even be having a conversation mm. about him at all. So that, that shows, one, his true ability to go into a new setup and prove himself. And two, his mental strength to go over there and take everything on with a new culture and everything else. So I feel like that in itself sets him up for long-term success because he clearly just smashes every goal that he meets. Yeah, he's unbelievable. And the two other players I'm really excited to see in an England shirt for the future is Bakari Saka, um, the Arsenal left winger, right winger, left winger. He plays anywhere that Arteta yeah. wants him. But uh, one from the under-23s I really want to see given a chance, maybe in like friendlies, um, is Eddie Nketiah. Yeah. Um, his record for the under-23s is unbelievable. Not only that, he does it for Arsenal when he put, gets put on as well. He gets the goals. And I think he could be another one if Kane's not there. And We've got so many strikers these days. It's unbelievable compared to what we had before. Um, we've got so many now. If, if we want to go and play a different system, we could put Calvert-Lewin and Kane on and we can have Nketiah there. We've got Danny, Danny Ings as well. We've got Callum Wilson that's now scoring for Newcastle. The list is endless at the moment, I think. It's, it's the depth of the England squad now, uh, I don't know whether... Uh, this is going to be controversial, and I want to see what you think on this, is because you're around about the same age as what I am, is the, the depth of squad is now is better than the David Beckham, Michael Owen era. Without a doubt. I yeah. think if you look at 
the whole St George's Park development yeah. and the way that we've gone about cultivating quality at younger levels, whether it's the under, I mean, the under-17 World Cup that we ended up winning mm-hmm. with Rian Brewster and, you know, Phil Foden, they're all coming to fruition now and there's no reason to suggest that won't continue. Mm-hmm. Um, you look at the under-21s, like you said, it's stacked full of quality. And if we can continue to give these people minutes, Jude Bellingham and Eze mm-hmm. and all the others, you know, they're extremely talented young footballers. And if that conveyor belt continues, it's about one, giving them first team minutes and two, making sure that when they get to the potential of playing for England, they're given chances in, in Nations League games or friendlies to actually bring yeah. them into the fold. And I think you're right with Jude Bellingham as well. That's another name I forgot about, but what a player he could be. And for what he did at Birmingham, I think Birmingham have taken it completely out of context of what he actually did for them by retiring his name and everything. They're just mental. But with, with him moving to Dortmund for 20 million and he's starting, He's not sitting on the bench where we all thought he might be. He's actually in there with the starting eleven. I know. Week in and week, it's like he did well for Birmingham. He did. Yeah. He did okay for them. But at the same time, he went to Dortmund and he's just he's grown. And he's the youngest ever goal scorer for the under twenty threes. He's the youngest ever person to get an assist for the under twenty threes, if I'm correct. And he's the youngest ever player to ever play for the under twenty threes or the under twenty ones, whatever it's called now, um, to play from as well. He is his future is so bright, it's unbelievable. And when you look at the way that Dortmund went about that deal, I think they were expecting him to sort of have a three or four month period of getting yeah. up to speed. And they were so shocked with his ability and his, his mental side of everything that they've just put him in because they know they can. So I think that's another part of it is that you've got players now that aren't afraid to go abroad and test themselves. It used to be back when we were growing mm-hmm. up, you had, like you say, the Paul Scholes, David Beckham era. Mm-hmm. The place that English players played was England. They'd yeah. rather go on loan to Preston than make the leap to Germany or France or wherever, whereas now that's changing. And I think it's it's doing us good because mm. someone like a Jaden Sancho can come back and they almost feel bona fide international ready, regardless of the fact that we as domestic supporters haven't seen as much of them as we otherwise would have done. And I always, I always say to players as well, not that we've ever done anything, but I always say to players, all the, my personal opinion is, is go to Portugal, go to Germany, go to Spain, go to France, go to all of these different countries, get a different perspective and culture of yeah. how different players play, because that will mould and bend you into an all-round player where you want to get to. And I, and I think now the kids and everyone are learning, like Ryan Sessegnon's now gone out on loan to Hoffenheim. Uh, yeah. Lookman signed for Leipzig and he's been out there, but he's come back on loan to Fulham and he looks like a quality player. Um, and it, I think youngsters need to sort of go, all right, if I'm not getting game time for a bigger club, let's go abroad and let's try my hand at doing that. I always um, look at Serge Nabry, like, if mm-hmm. you think about him, Arsenal, yeah. I know it's not necessarily an England player, of course, but he was there and people weren't really sure about him and he's gone over to Munich and it's a huge, huge challenge and he's a key part of their side now. And you can't tell me that if he'd gone and signed for West Ham, for example, mm-hmm. that he would have been the success he is now. And it is a lot to do with different cultures, different tactics, yeah. different systems. And I, I think it's the way forward, really. Yeah. And I think Gnabry is a perfect example because when he was at Arsenal, uh, everyone had high hopes of him, but he was never doing anything about it. He went on loan to West Brom and, mm. and Tony Pulis said he would never become of anything because he wasn't good Tony enough. Uh, yeah, that is. Uh, and then he went off on loan to somewhere else and it didn't really work out for him. And then he got released and went to Hoffenheim. I think it was Hoffenheim he went to, or Schalke. It was one of them two he went to. And he was on there for, uh, I think it was like three, four million. Uh, and then he had two breakout seasons, thought he was doing okay, did really well. And Bayern Munich were like, okay, we think he'd be okay, a good backup to Iron Robin and Frank Ribery. And then when he signed for them, he just absolutely blew it out of the water. And he's, he's one of the best players from now. Um, let's move on to the Premier League proposal. Um, it's got a lot of conflicting uh, reports. Um, we've got the big Premier League teams that want to do it. We've got uh, League One and League Two clubs saying go ahead and do it. You've got some of the um, championship teams um, saying do it. Some of them saying not. Um, so this, this, I'm just going to quickly go through the main points 
um, to what has been proposed and what the some of the things that they're saying is one of the most appealing, according to reports, says 25% of all combined Premier League and EFL revenues will be going to EFL clubs with an advance of up to 250 million being made available during to help pay in, during this pandemic. Along with the 250 million upfront payment to the to the EFL, the FA will also receive 100 million pounds as a gift. I presume that's probably bribery, um, as well as the Premier League reducing its size from 20 clubs to 18 there will be an exchange uh, for promotion relegation exchange between the second tier between the championship the bottom two teams will automatically get relegated to, from the premier league and replaced with the top two teams in the championship 16th if there was 18 teams uh, would go into the playoffs um, into the championship which would mean the playoff system in the championship would be third fourth and fifth the sixth team won't come in. Uh, the usual curtain raise of the Community Shield will not be there anymore. We'll, we'll match between the, the FA Cup winners and the Premier League winners would be scrapped. Along with the EFL Cup, other reports are suggesting that the EFL Cup will only be played for teams that are not in European competition. Um, a lot of people are saying they didn't want to go out. It's the big six team trying to step their mark in. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions and I want to see what you think. Um, what do you what is your main because I, I i don't know what what are you with it are you against it or are you for I'm it massively against it massively. Right. what is putting you against it i i feel as though you you look at this whole situation and unfortunately because of coronavirus and what it's brought about in terms of football finance and, and the desperate situation that people in league one and league two find themselves in it's almost um, crisis management from the Premier League that's dressed up as charity and altruism but is actually just opportunism because they know full well that without fans being allowed into your Colchester Uniteds and your Newport Counties those football clubs will die they need a handout it's a fact because they don't have sponsorship deals they don't have TV deals they rely almost solely on bums on seats and people coming through the gates yeah. and in a normal scenario where people actually understand the hardship that people are going through, you would assume that the people at the top of the tree would say the entire pyramid is important to English football and, and the good of everybody. But that's not where we find ourselves now. We find ourselves in a situation where Manchester United, Liverpool, Arsenal, etc. are looking upon this as an opportunity to rubber stamp their status at the top of the game for a few crumbs out to the people that desperately need it. And because they desperately need it, give them no choice but to accept it. And I think once, once you bring in this system, there's already a huge gap between the top six and the rest of the division. It's something we touched upon at the start of the podcast in relation to Crystal Palace and any ambitions we may have of getting into that top six bracket. This is going to pretty much end any hope of a team doing what Leicester City did or a team such as West Ham, for example. That's a bad example, really, because they're going to be part of the nine shareholders. But a club that has aspirations similar to Reading or Palace. You know, we've obviously got vested interest in both those clubs. If a billionaire wanted to come in and turn Reading into a powerhouse, the fact that these nine long-term shareholders would have the opportunity to veto the actual owner taking charge of that, despite the fact they may want to make massive changes to your infrastructure and make huge changes to your training ground and the local area, if they don't want it to happen and they vote against it, you will be banned from having that owner under these new proposals. So it basically creates a situation where you can't break in. You know, you are stuck where you are and you should be happy about that because without them, you'd have died anyway. And as much as, you know, I can understand the logic from a business perspective, I feel as though it's, it's so bad because you're in a situation where you have no choice but to accept if you're a League One or Two club, but you know that it's all but killing off competition in the long term. See, the, the, I'm going to put my, my personal opinion on it in a minute. And with a billionaire, Reading have, do have a billionaire at the moment. We're just restricted by financial fair play because mm -hmm. we screwed up so much in the past. Um, but we, we've got a new training ground and everything now. Um, so the, the, thing, the stories that I can sort of pick from it is it's basically the bigger clubs want to make more money abroad. So they want to hit more of the clubs like China where they can't hit in the moment because the Premier League are doing it themselves. It's becoming that what they're, what they're asking for is
is the clubs to do what they want to do individually compared to the Premier League running it as a whole. It's become a Man United are turning saying what I've seen and what I, what I gather from it is Man United are saying, yeah, we're getting a percentage of what the Premier League are making from China, but, and all the other clubs are getting the same thing as well, but we are one of the biggest football clubs in the world. We deserve the opportunity to go to China and make our own money and do our own thing. And I think what I can see from the proposal and what I can see from it is they've taken a combination of what goes on in Germany, Portugal um, and Spain and sort of try to make it into one, but without thinking a lot into it. So the reason why I say that is the playoff system is definitely German uh, because they do that in the German league. The bottom of the, the third from bottom of Bundesliga plays the promotion winner uh, for the championship or the Bundesliga dry. Uh, and the winner of that stays up or goes up. Uh, the Portugal is for the match day revenue because I don't know whether you know a little about Portuguese football. Um, but in Portugal, Benfica and Porto have their own channel, have their own source of income. If you want to watch every single match, you pay 10... It's a bit like what they do for Netflix with Portugal, um, with Benfica and Porto. Uh, Benfica, Porto and Sporting have a Netflix sort of type TV where you pay £10 a month. You will get every single match home or away. You can watch it if you can't make the ground. You will see all of the friendlies, all of the uh, stories or any um, interactive stuff that they want to do with the club, any history or anything like that. It will be solely based just for Benfica fans. And I think that's one of the things I saw here where it will become Man United will have their own channel where they can just stream their matches on their on their channel, but it will still go up on match of the day and stuff like that uh, and the other one is basically like this like what the spanish clubs do is they control the finances the premier league come in and go okay yeah that's fine no matter how you do what you want to do but like the barcelona's and the real madrid's they basically have full control over what they want to do do you think they've done that but they haven't really thought about it logically i i feel as though i mean you're spot on everything you said there in terms of the, the mechanisms that they're trying to put in place i mean i call it um, partisanship or, or love. Um, mm. I feel as though the Premier League is the most widely watched league in the world, not because of Man United and Liverpool exclusively, mm. but because of the depth of competition. You know, and fans play a huge part in this, by the way, because if you look at the tribalism of English football, the depth of English football, the fact that we've got a 92 team pyramid, the fact that you could be a Swindon Town fan and care just as much about your team as you do if you're a Man United fan. You know, you look at Portugal, as you mentioned, you've got sport, sport in Lisbon, you've got Porto, you've got Benfica, and a lot of people in Portugal will have their local team, but they'll also support Porto, for mm -hmm. example. It's just it's a thing that happens over there. In England, that is seen as, as plastic. That's seen yeah. as something you don't do. You can support your Man United and your Liverpools, but don't also say you support Walsall. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, and I feel as though this whole scheme is going to just crystallise that in everyone's mind, because you're... you're blocking off the opportunity for anybody really to have any ambition of ever joining that group. You can look at it and say that Real Madrid and Barcelona control the money in Spain, but I don't feel as though that's the way it should be. You know, mm -hmm. I understand why they do it, but I don't, I want to be able to see Villarreal potentially win a title. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to see Real Betis challenging up the top. When Atletico Madrid won the league under Diego Simeone not so long ago, that was a fantastic story. I love that. You know, you look at Germany and this, this assumption that it's going to be Borussia Dortmund or Bayern Munich and mostly Bayern Munich every year. You know, the chances of Hertha Berlin crashing a party and winning a title are infinitesimally small. And I, I just feel as though that's not what football should be about. It should be. And I'm not suggesting that we should do what they do in the States. And if you finish bottom of the league, you don't get relegated, but you get more money because that doesn't work either. Yeah. But there needs to be some sort of a goal to aim for. Because you're talking to me at the start of it about Palace and we're saying, we you know, ninth would be fantastic for us. The difference being, at the moment, if we finished ninth and we kept hold of our best players and we invested again, we could kick on to seventh. And then if you did the same again, you could kick on to sixth. But if this continues to go down this path, I feel as though that chance of ever breaking into a top six is just walled off. You're almost in a situation where you've got a division of six and a division of 14 that fight out amongst each other for the scraps. And I don't really feel that's the method that English football should be going down. Unfortunately, with the likes of the Glazer family and John W. Henry and Gazidis, that it's going to be a closed shop if they get their way because they, why would you want to change a winning formula from their point of view? 
You know, you look at Manchester United at the moment, they're struggling massively for form. But if this comes in finance-wise, it's game over anyway because mm. it's so separate to what everyone else is doing money-wise that there's no real jeopardy involved in them losing matches because they're still going to have more money than us at the rest of the, at the end of the season. So, I don't know, I feel extremely strongly about it and I think millions of others do. Hopefully that opposition means that it won't go through, but you can't really tell anything these days. And without anyone in stadiums, it's, it's less in your face. You know, you can get something yeah. like that through. So it's a worry for sure. So for me personally, I think if it's, it's a good idea to a certain extent. I'm not fully against it, but I'm not fully for it. The reason why I say I'm not fully against it is because I think the Premier League is very, very good. And I think the Premier League is very enticing. And I think the way that they market the Premier League and the EFL is, is so much different because the, as an EFL club, is they market the EFL so rubbish. And the EFL are terrible as it is anyway. Uh, the way that they look after clubs, the way they do it and everything like that. But to make it more exciting and the more of the combination between it, I get the playoff system. I think that could be fun. And I think that's very exciting as well in Germany as well when they do it. It is very, very exciting to do as well for them to see if... And, and it'd be quite funny as well because if, like a, this hypothesis, say, like a Fulham, they'll be relegated. But if they finish third from bottom and had to go into the playoff system, could they go up against like a Brentford or a Reading or a Watford or a Norwich? No way. So it'd be interesting to see how they got on. I think that side of it, yes. I think money side, I think they've got to be very, very careful with how they do this. If they can do find a way of maybe doing, and I said this as well, one of the things that, that annoyed me the most with the Premier League was when they said, if you want to watch your club, pay extra £15 with on top of what you pay for Sky and with or BT as well, pay £50. Why do the Premier League not do a platform like a Netflix where they can put games on, control what's on there, £10 a month, put whatever content on, you can have separate systems for different teams or do whatever, you can have like a WWE network, like a Netflix, like an Amazon Prime, that sort of stuff. Why is that not going through their brain to do something like that? Supposedly, and I've read in the Athletic about it, the, the main opposition from Premier League football clubs to that system is that it would be a month-by-month -month income mm -hmm. rather than them getting their lump sum at the beginning of every season of, say, yeah. 120 million. My counter-argument to that is you'd have three or four times as many people signing up, so your 120 million might turn into 200 million over the course of 12 months. Exactly. That's just budgeting. Um, but supposedly that's the main opposition to it because clubs like to have their full amount of money, they can buy who they want to buy, they can do their wages how they want to do it, and then there's not as much jeopardy because they've got it regardless of whether they get relegated or not. Um, but to me, that's just a lack of backing in yourselves to spend the money properly and keep your heads above water in the Premier League. Um, but, I mean, it is multifaceted. I think... I don't necessarily have a problem with the playoff system changes. I don't necessarily have a problem with a fair few different alterations they're putting forward. It's more the fact that they're doing it in a way that's almost forcing the hands of clubs mm. who have to take this as like a handout because coronavirus has put them into a situation where they have no choice. That It just feels so opportunistic and so harsh. And it, it, I don't think the timing is a coincidence at all. No, I think I they, they wouldn't have got away with this a year ago. They wouldn't have even you know put it forward because it would have got laughed out. But now you've got club owners in League One and League Two that have got no choice because mm. they're either that or go out of business altogether. And it, it, it strikes me. I mean, I said it on Twitter this morning. It's like the landowners of old. You know, your house mm. gets destroyed in a storm. You come along and go, oh, you can live in my barn. I'll give you some water and some bread and I'll buy your land for 20 quid. Is that all right? And you haven't got a house, so you have to accept it. Mm. You don't want to accept it, but you have no choice because you've got to give your family, you know, shelter and food and water and that, it just feels that way to me and I don't mm. like the whole tone of it but unfortunately it looks like they're going to try and push it through. The, one of the things that I found very fascinating last night was when I was um, going through Twitter was the guests that they were having on Talk Sport um, and they had the um, League Two owner on and what he said was is at the moment he's predicting by the end of the year there's no fans of going on that's a two million pound loss he will have mm -hmm. to other clubs that's like well uh, two million two million but for a league two club that's nearly <laughs> ending um and what he said was and the peterborough chairman who's very vocal in what he thinks of everything anyway was he said was we want this deal to go through because we will make more money not only by generating the income we will get from the efl and the premier league 
but the players that we have will be will be more because what he said was one of the things was is at the moment if this deal goes through his club will be entitled to 10 million pounds and what he said was is that gives us more chance to now get promoted to the championship and with that promotion to the championship he had um ivan tony or tovey i think his name was and he was sold to um brentford for around about eight million pounds he said if the deal went through now i could sell that player for 20 million Mm -hmm. easily he goes so for me a deal like for us to get promoted and with that if we had that play in the championship and we sold it to a premier league we could sell them for 30 40 million he goes so this is why i think the league one and league two clubs wanted to go through the championship clubs i don't think have actually said anything um to what i've seen reddit never say anything anyway We'd, we just go with the flow knowing us or our chinese owners will try and buy our way out of it knowing us um but so if, if you had so it, what proposals would need to change for you to get behind it? It's not I don't know, I mean I don't want to drill down into specifics mm-hmm. over what I would change because I think it's more the feel of it than anything else. And it's the opportunistic nature of it. Yeah. You know, to to counter argument Darren McCantney's point, yes, he would have more money, but so would everyone else. Mm-hmm. It doesn't it doesn't put you above anyone else. It puts you on the same playing field as everyone else, just with more money like everyone else has got. And whilst it may safeguard your club's future in the long term, it doesn't necessarily mean that clubs will spend that money wisely. Because as we well know, clubs in League One and Two spend all of their money anyway. You know, that they have to to keep up with the Joneses. And all it does is wall off the potential of Darren McCampton ever getting to the Premier League, which I'm sure is his overall aim. Yeah, he's he's really, said really that. Really realistic. Yeah. But it stops the ability for him to do that. So it's this short-termism all the time. And unfortunately, coronavirus has brought that on us because there is the need for finance. And I don't know. I, I don't really see that there's a great deal wrong with football as it is. I feel as though it's a huge pyramid. It's something that we love being a part of. It's something that we should rightly cherish. And if you look at the £350 million, pound, when you, the £250 million, the £100, pound, £100 million pound gift, which... Sounds extremely dodgy in its own mm. word. Yeah, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> Shuts out three hundred and fifty million pounds between all the Premier League clubs. It's a drop in the ocean, right? Mm-hmm. It sorts out the problem. It sorts out football league clubs until they can get fans back in stadiums, right? And it's done. Then the football yeah. continues the same way. It's just that the Premier League as a whole is three hundred and fifty million pounds worse off. Which compared to compared to football league clubs, that's nothing. You don't need to change anything. The reason we're talking about it now, the reason you have a podcast and I have a podcast and people listen to us is because of the love people have for football in this country. And if you're going to try and change the very fabric of that to suit your own needs as someone who runs a top football club, you're potentially damaging it beyond all repair, in my Mm. opinion. Yeah, I'd be interested to see what happens in the next... um few weeks for that but yeah though so thank you ever so much for coming on and putting your opinion across and right. talking about yourself um so that's it that's the end of the podcast for this week uh we this has been absolutely fantastic this has probably been one of the best podcasts i've ever recorded um so thank you ever so much for coming on and thank you ever so much for doing this um so yeah in in the description down below of the youtube video and the description down below on the um soundcloud there is a link to his patreon and um, please go and sign up either just want to listen to about crystal palace or or listen to his general and um, i signed up for the general one because of like because of the insight that he has is unbelievable and it's spot on most of the time anyway um so go and sign up on that go and follow him on twitter as well um please if you're here and you're new um please go and subscribe to the youtube channel we will be doing more of these content every wednesday uh, and, and maybe a friday as well we mix in a bit bit between the reading preview um of the match coming up and we do a bit of the preview of what's coming up over the weekend as well um so please come love and subscribe and take care and hope everyone does well and thank you ever so much for coming on no worries thank you and, very much. and everyone take care bye